<laughs> and here you see, uh, uh, during World War I, during the Turkish invasions uh, of the Lake Urmia region, how the Armenians were fleeing northward toward Yerevan and Tiflis. Next. And then in the second invasion, in 1918, two times, 1915 and 1918, Turkish armies entered the area. And in the second invasion, the Armenians fled southward toward Baghdad. And if you go to Baghdad today, you'll find that most of these people are descendants of those people who fled from here and who fled from Bonn. There are numerous, anyone Bonn had say here? Numerous Vonetsis who, um, who uh, uh, transferred and lived in uh, Baghdad and became the community leaders of that uh, city, which thrived so long before, again, Armenians were uprooted one more time. And here the, you see the Armenian refugees who had fled from um, uh, Lake Ormia to uh, Baghdad or near Baghdad. Next. Um, let's go next. Next. Uh, this is Khoi today again. Uh, there are no Armenians left in these areas. They've all been depopulated. But the Iranian government has uh, reconstructed the Armenian church of Serb Sarkis in Khoi. Next. Now, that was the northern half of Iran. And uh, you know, they, they lived very different lives from those of the south. So when we talk about a Persian Armenian community, remember, we have to remember that they have very different experiences, very different histories, and that this one, unlike the other one, um, started in 1600, whereas the Azerbaijan communities date back to the pre-Christian era. era. The um, name of this town and region is New Julfa, or in their dialect, Norjuha. Next. Juha, the original Juha. Uh, can we point out Tabriz on the map? Above Tabriz, you'll see Armenia. Right on the river there was a very famous merchant Armenian community on the Arox River, Arox Keta. They were Jovayetsis. And they had for a long time been engaged in the international trade of silk, uh, spices, and precious stones. In the year around, in and about, 1600, that's 400 years ago. The new ruler of Iran, who started the new dynasty, his name happened to be Shah Abbas, A-B-B-A-S. Shah Abbas uh, tried to reclaim lands that the Turkish Empire, the sultans, had captured and taken, including Van, uh, including part of uh, Yerevan, and so forth. And so he came up with a strategy of fighting the Turks by making it impossible for them to advance farther into Iran by removing all the population from the area, burning all the towns and villages in the scorched earth policy. 
So that in 1604 and 1605, he sent his armies to the plain of Arara, Arayantash, and there forcibly removed hundreds of thousands of Armenians from Yerevan, Sevan, Van, Vasparagan, um, and forcibly moved them across the Aroks River south into his country. It was terrible. You can imagine um, having to get up and leave everything, including this one city of Juha, which is in fabulously wealthy city. Fabulously. And they had no choice. They were forced to move. And many of the peasants or farmers scattered all over the northern part of Iran, uh, up to where you see Tehran, which is today's capital, and which until a hundred years ago was like a backward town. And then if you go farther south, you find a city known as Isfahan, Isfahan. There, Shah Abbas moved his capital and built a beautiful capital there, which is still amazing if you go to visit it, filled with tiles and pools and palaces. And he wanted also to take advantage of the Armenians whom he had forcibly moved into his country. And so he took them, not all of them, but those who were the merchant class, he took them to Isfahan. And then he said, across this river, there's a little river there, you will go and you will build your churches and your institutions, and you will live according to your Christian laws. And no Muslim, because the Persians by then had become Muslim, Shiites, no Muslim will be allowed to live in your city, which they named Nurjuha, because they had come from Old Juha on the Aroks River, several hundred miles away, and now they came down and they created in amazingly fast time an Armenian quarter or a township known as New Julfa. Uh, when I saw it first uh, as a student returning from Beirut where I went to learn Armenian and I went by way of Asia to Iraq and Iran and farther on, I, I was astounded uh, by New Julfa, not only by the beauty of Esfahan, but I couldn't figure out the, the town because they had 13 churches, and to me, they looked like mosques because they had domes that looked like dom, mosques, which showed that the Armenians had sort of adapted to the local architecture and to the local, uh, what was expected. Maybe not to draw attention. I don't know why, but it was really impressive. The second thing that impressed me was in an area of about one square kilometer or one square mile, they had built 13 fabulous churches. And they were so wealthy that they were able to bring in European painters and then Armenian painters who learned and adapted to create churches that were filled with murals and mosaics and tiles from top to bottom. I mean, our churches, Armenian churches, as you well know, are very simple. We don't even allow rounded statues. But here, everything was so different from 
the kinds of Armenians that I had ever uh, been with. Next. Uh, this just shows uh, the, how the Jewelfum merchants, uh, one generation after they had moved. Now, most, my generation, I'm a child of immigrants. Some of you are children of or grandchildren of immigrants. You know how hard it was and how many years it took for them to get back on their feet and to thrive. And yet these people, because they already had international trade networks, were trading in China and Mongolia and India and, and Spain uh, within one generation of their having been forcibly deported to uh, Iran. Next. Here you see the trade route to, uh, from New Julfa across the Caspian Sea, upward all the way to Sweden. And then they have, they get the uh, smart, they're able to negotiate with the kings of these foreign countries to get monopolies on the sale of silk or certain uh, commodities. They, the Armenian merchants, hold the monopoly on it. No one else can have it. Next. Uh, here we're in Cadiz, Spain. You know where that is? Uh, way over in the west of Spain. Uh, New Julfa merchants have gone over in 1685. They're pledging a donation for to build a church in uh, Cadiz, Spain. Next. This is the church of Santa Maria and its baptismal font. Still standing like this. In, uh, in Cadiz, a port city. Next. And here you see the tiles that uh, they adorn that church. Next. Now we're at um, New Julfa and uh, the uh, All Savior Monastery, Amira Pargic, Wanker. And you look at that, look at the uh, Kapet. Isn't that a mosque? <laughs> and here they are, they adapted these. And yet when you go inside, it's really very different. Next. And here are you again, you see a panorama of three or four of the Armenian churches with their comfits. Next. Here you see 13 Armenian churches right along the river, near the river. And you know it's amazing. In one of these churches, they call it the Echmiazin Church, there is a stone or a boulder that must weigh, I don't know, five tons. And yet these people that were longing for their homeland so much that they were able to somehow draw that five-ton brick or bring that five-ton brick from Echmiazin all the way to Julfa, where it became a, like a, a, a relic or a devoted object. Next. Now here, look inside the church. Look at the mosaics, look at the tiles, look at the murals. From ceiling to the sides, uh, four-sided, all around, with master painters. And uh, just uh, uh, this, again, could not be done without the extraordinary wealth that the New Julfan merchant was able to accumulate. Next. And again, All Savior Cathedral, top to bottom with murals and frescoes. And the tiles, Amina Pargic, next. Uh, the Surpas Vazazin, Holy Mother of God Church, next. The Belfry. And inside the church, again, the decorations. You can go on. 
this, uh, it's interesting because this is not religious now. What you're seeing now is in a private home, the rich merchants would um, uh, enlist commission the painters to embellish their homes. Again, uh, in a private home, Sukiyasu, you might say Kakusneta, look what they're, what they're wearing, they're like uh, European dress uh, of the time. Um, one of the authors, uh, Sarah Laporte, uh, we have another Laporte, um, compares Armenian painters with possibly European models that they probably looked at and you know, use. So on one side, she shows what's in the cathedral or the churches, and then on the other side, possible models from which the Armenian artists borrowed. Next. And again, here we have Jonah. Uh, again, a very similar model, left and right. Next. And, uh, all right. Here, and now, uh, this is currently the Prelacy building. It still exists in Julpa. Unfortunately, much of its population left for Armenia and then or to the United States and other countries and during the Islamic Revolution. But this is the Prelacy building. Next. And this is their library, their Shirali library. And to the right is a, um, a bust, Gisantiru Khachadur Gesarazi. Khachadur Gesarazi was the primate, uh, the bishop of New Julfa, uh, just one generation after the Armenians arrived there. And he is well loved and remembered. He was so forward looking that he had a priest import a printing press from Europe to New Julfa, where they started printing in by the mid 1600s. And it became the first press in the Middle East by an Armenian bishop, an Armenian church in the city of Nojula. This is a bus dedicated to him. Next. And this is uh, the library. And here we have them. They even, in recent years, have created a, a museum with very, very valuable uh, objects, not only of religious art, but also of uh, other uh, genres. Here you see a woman of New Julfa as she looked in the 17th and 18th century. Now, outside of uh, Julfa, there were numerous Armenian villages where they were not Julaitzis, but had come from the provinces of Armenia and where they continued their peasant life generation after generation. Now here you see, here they are in 1915, uh, women of Charmahal uh, as in their uh, traditional dress of that time. And uh, the uh, shaking of wheat, and the threshing of wheat. And here they are uh, in a village of Boran. Uh, interesting that they're all wearing red. And I don't know if it's because of the holiday, which was Vartavar in July, or perhaps this is more likely their daily garb. Here you see them once again. Um, Nujulfa is um, proud of its theater. It created an Armenian theater. Um, uh, in the 1880s, 1880s. How long is that? 140 years or something. Um, next. Here you see, uh, this is the first uh, 
a school individual, but I, <coughs> here you see the first programs of the theater uh, individual. But the first one on the left is handwritten and uh, copied. But the one on the right in 1888 is a printed uh, program of the presentation. And here they are in the 